Hello everyone, welcome to our March 2023 You Lead webinar. And as people are popping on and our panelists are opening up their screens, uh, we definitely were, sometimes we've had trouble with our chat a little bit section. And so Michelle's definitely doing that. And yay, so Sonia is already on here from Fresno, California. So thank you for doing that. Go into that chat section, open it up, tell us your name where you're from we would love to say hello we also probably have a lot of new people on this particular webinar because we had over 400 women sign up for this webinar so thank you for joining us i'm kelly king i'm the women's ministry specialist at lifeway in case you don't know who i am so i'm kind of your host for these webinars and we really do appreciate you this is so fun seeing where you are from i'm actually coming from you today um, from my home state in oklahoma i'm not in nashville right now and so i'm in a little bit of different place i don't have my different monitors so it's going to be fun for me to kind of figure out how I'm looking at the questions and keeping to my script. So if I look like I'm looking away, just know that I'm trying to look at different screens. But thank you for being here. I do have a few announcements that I want to just make sure that you're aware of, of things that are coming up from Lifeway Women. One of them, and as I saw some of you from the West Coast, you may not be aware that we have our West Coast Women's Leadership Forum coming in July to Highland, California. That's in Southern California. And we need you to sign up soon because we don't have a whole lot of women signed up and it's really, we're feeling that stress and the pressure of, hey, who's coming? We need you to come. So check that out at lifeway.com. Just put in Women's Forum and you'll see all the details. But Jen Wilkin will be there and we'll have Courtney Doctor, Elizabeth Woodson, Dr. Jeff Orge, who's done so many books on leadership. So this is a great opportunity for you to come. Hey, it's summer. It's vacation time. Come to California. What a great time to join us. We would love to see you there. Also, there's a couple of new Bible studies I want to mention. One of them, and I thought I had a copy with me, but I can't seem to put my hands on it, but it's a new one by a new author for us. She's not a new author. She's written several things, Rebecca McLaughlin, and she has written a study called Navigating Gospel Truth, and it really helps you see the Gospels and the genres of, of the Gospels, and so it's a really great new Bible study. I'd love for you to check that out, and then a new one that's getting ready to release is called When You Pray, and When You Pray is a compilation of several of our favorite authors each one of them take a different week and they take a different aspect of prayer it was filmed last year at life women live and it with the intent of this was going to be a bible study so that is definitely one that you want to check out there are some special kind of auxiliary products um, you can even buy kind of an experience box if you wanted to do it as a retreat so you can go to lifeway.com and just put in when you pray and you're going to find out the details there as well. Each month we give away a free resource to someone who is on our Ministry to Women newsletter list. So if you are not on that list, you need to go to lifeway.com slash ministry news, sign up, and you'll be automatically registered to win a free gift. And today, um, one of our, our giveaway is a book by one of our authors, Elizabeth Woodson, called Embrace Your Life. And the reason we picked this book is that Elizabeth really touches on her own singleness. She's a single woman. And so it felt like it was a really good match for the topic of ministering to single women. So we definitely want you to check that out as well. I do, I'll have a moment here of just wanting you to meet um, the panelists who are with us today. So I'm going to uh, tell you who they are and they're going to jump on real quickly and just give you a brief introduction of who they are. So Adriana, let's start with you. Hi, ladies. I have been a Christian for 33 years and in ministry to women for over 20 years. I'm a trainer with Lifeway Women and an event specialist coach with Lifeway Women. I serve on the Women's uh, Ministry Wives Task Force for the Missouri Baptist Convention, and I'm on our church's Women's Ministries leadership team. I'm married to Gregory. We have one daughter, a son-in-law, three grandchildren, a dog, and two cats. Together in ministry, Gregory and I support churches who are in pursuit of racial unity, and we currently live in Missouri and have a home in Alabama. It's good to be here with y'all today. Thanks so much. Faith, jump on and tell us a little bit about you. 
Yeah. Hey friends, my name is Faith and I'm currently serving at a church in Kingwood, Texas. It's just right outside of Houston. I'm the girls minister there. I've been here for, gosh, it's been four years now. And before that, I know it's crazy. Before that, I was actually hanging with Kelly over in Nashville at, at Lifeway and Michelle and um, I worked with Fuge, which is one of their camps there for, for their student department. And so just had a blast uh, over there working with just students as a whole. Um, and I'm, I'm so excited to be here with you guys and uh, to have just this conversation because it's so important. So thanks for having me. Yeah, and a lot of you know Mary Margaret West, but I want you to make sure that you do know her. So Mary Margaret, give us a quick intro. Thank you, Kelly. I'm Mary Margaret West. I am here in Orlando, Florida, which is my hometown. Um, and the Lord brought me and my husband, Jonathan, back here almost four years ago. And um, we have a one-year-old little boy named Sam, who my dad is watching out there. So if there is some commotion, I'm just going to ignore it. I told my dad, I was like, don't holler at me because I'm on a webinar. But um, anyway, we um, have lived here almost four years, um, love being in Orlando. And um, we are a part of a little church called the Grove Church in Claremont, which is on the west side of Orlando. And I am now serving as the volunteer women's ministry director, which is so much fun. And I am loving um, just getting to kind of start things from the ground up and do that in a volunteer way in this season of life of being a stay at home mom. Um, but I have been in ministry of some sort for about 18 years now, um, a lot of student and girls ministry and then women's ministry at well, as well. And I served at Lifeway with Kelly and Faith and Michelle and Catherine and so many other folks for about seven years. So um, lots of fun memories from Lifeway. Yes, we are so, so glad to have you all here. So if you've been on one of our webinars in the past, uh, sometimes we go in and we actually have a little bit of a poll that we like to just ask you about and say, hey, how about, um, we want to know a little bit about you. So we've got a poll that I want to launch here and it's on just ministering to single women. And so I'm going to actually launch this poll and you can vote for it. But the question is on a scale of one to five, with five being the highest, like you feel like you do good, how well do you think your church currently ministers to single women? So one being the lowest, five being the highest, or at the bottom, you can just say, we need help. That I decided I would add that as an option at the bottom. I'm going to give you just a few seconds. We'll at least give you a minute to go in and put in what you think, how you would rate yourself. All right, I'm going to give you just a little bit more. Oh, oh, wow. A lot of you have already voted, so that's good. Sometimes it's hard if you're on a phone. It'd be hard to maybe do the poll, but if you're on a laptop, it's a little bit easier. I don't know how, if that affects some of you or not, but almost all of you have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. This is really interesting because it's all over the map. I'm going to share my results here. So hopefully you can see this. It looks like 31% of you said you're in the middle, like maybe you're doing an okay job, but maybe you could do better. I think it's interesting 27% of you said, hey, we need some help. And then 18% of you said too, I mean, there's definitely a need for this, definitely something that we feel like maybe we're not doing as good a job of maybe ministering. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll, but that really helps us as we dive into this subject to kind of get an idea of maybe where you feel like you are and why you even showed up for this particular webinar. Adriana and Mary Margaret, you're both married now, but you have had seasons of singleness. Faith is, is single right now. And so I do want to start with that. I think that it'd be good for everyone to hear a little bit of your journey because it's a little bit different. So um, Adriana, why don't you start and, and tell us a little bit about your journey of singleness? Sure. So uh, sadly, I became a widow at the age of 24, um, which is a very difficult season of my life. But by God's grace, he brought my current husband, who's also a Christian, uh, into my life. And at the age of 35, we married. So uh, I basically had an 11 year journey of serving God um, in many different areas of ministry. Uh, in a foreign country as a missionary, in women's prison ministry, with female recovering drug addicts, uh, women escaping human trafficking, and of course, ministry to widows, which is one of my greatest passions. So um, yeah, quite the journey. 
Yeah, and, and that was one of the things when we began thinking about the subject is that we tend to kind of think of singles in one particular aspect, but we do want to bring in the aspect of being widowed. And so because that is um, just a segment of our population in our churches that we do need to think about and to minister to. So I think Adrienne is going to bring in some really good just compassion and just some insight into that particular demographic. Mary Margaret, let's have you go next. All right. Well, I was um, single until I was 33. And, um, and I think for me, it was, you know, and that's when I looking back now, I'm like, I wasn't as old as I thought I was still being single. Um, but really up until that point, I had never dated. I didn't date in high school and college as a single woman. And I just thought that the Lord had kind of forgotten that I was still over there. And, um, and so I think my singleness was was truly walking single, um, you know, up until I met my husband, Jonathan, which we met online, don't count it out. And, um, you know, but there were so many ways that I, you know, felt ministered to, felt loved on. You know, there were, you know, moments where I had to stand up for myself and represent the single women in my church or in my community and things like that. Um, but, but that was kind of my journey up until I met Jonathan was true singleness that entire time. Yeah. And I think that we've seen just even over the last maybe 10 years, Mary Margaret, like people are waiting to get married. I actually heard this yesterday and it was interesting to me that Gen Z are kind of bucking that trend a little bit and getting married younger, but definitely um, I would say millennials, like there has been a trend of waiting or like it just the opportunities or feeling like they you know, met the right person, that that has been delayed a little bit as well. So Faith, give us a little bit of your journey right now. Yeah, mine's short and sweet. I'm single. <laughs> um, but I think one of the beautiful parts of, of my story is I think the Lord has, has brought me through a season where it's something that I desire a lot of times. It's something that um, I celebrate. And I think sometimes that's really hard, especially in the church sometimes of wanting, I think people just love their marriages, which praise God for that. And so they want others to experience that. Um, but it, there's been a lot of seasons in my life where the Lord has just kind of walked me through and I've been like, no, being single right now is best. And I say that not being in the back of my head going, I don't mean this at all, <laughs> but truly. Um, and so it's something that I, have kind of been on this journey of wanting to celebrate with other single people of, listen, this is, this just might be the season the Lord has you in and how can he best use you? And let's celebrate in that. That's not discounting the feelings that we'll talk about this later of the longing that's there. Um, but I think that's sort of unique, um, for me is uh, like, let's celebrate it. Let's just dive into all that the Lord has with that title of singleness. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that's a good way to, to put that, that we can celebrate. We can celebrate singleness. And Adriana, I want us to start with scripture because scripture actually says some really good things about being single. So would you just elaborate a little bit on that? Oh, you're muted, Adriana. Sorry, I think they're going to put in the chat um, some verses that are really important on this subject. Uh, and so I just want to run through them really quickly. But these are just some things that the Apostle Paul um, says specifically to the unmarried and widows. And this is in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and so I want you to really pay close attention to some of the places that he emphasizes. And there are some key phrases and uh, statements that he uses. So it says, now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now he speaks to the married and to the unmarried and the widows. I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. 
but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Philippians 4.11 says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So Paul is really admonishing and strongly encouraging believers to be content in whatever status that you are in and to have an undivided devotion to Christ. And that's our calling truly, regardless of our marital status. So whether we're married or single, ultimately God's heart and call for us is to have undevoted devotion to him and undivided attention on him. I, I think those verses are just a good reminder that it is a gift, that it is not a it's it's not a bad thing that singleness can be a really good thing that can be used for the Lord. And as some of you have put in there too, as far as even like you've had the heartache of maybe divorce or maybe being widowed after a long time. So there are there are different aspects to singleness we we don't want to like just say it all lumps together but also um i do think you you kind of said something that um one time someone said do you think god has called you to be single and i loved her answer because she said i i believe the lord has called me to him that is the primary thing is that he has called me to himself and that if that means that I'm single, then that is what he has called me to at that particular point in my life. And so to remind to re, to be reminded that God is good in, in every in every relationship status. So I think that's such a good place. And I, I think it would be good for us to think about. We, we have some great modern examples of single women who God has used mightily for his glory. So. Mary Margaret, why don't you just remind us? I think it's good for us to remember how God has used single women. Oh, absolutely. And they're just, I feel like my brain is going to short out in a second on trying to think of as many as I thought of the other day, um, you know, as I was kind of preparing for this, but it's like, you look at somebody like Lottie Moon that that God used so powerfully as a missionary, somebody like Elizabeth Elliot as a widow who God used in her singleness to write and to give us such powerful truths of how she was connected to the Lord, um, both in marriage and in singleness and in, and in the process of grieving the loss of her husband. Um, you know, I I even think of some of our current Lifeway authors like Lisa Harper, Kelly Minter, Christy McClellan, who have just given their lives to the Lord and trusted him um, in the season that they're in and just continue to pursue him wholeheartedly. And, um, you know, and I think that there is, um, it's such an interesting shift to, to, for our brains to wrap around because of the way that our culture looks at marriage, that sometimes singleness gets this, like, this like, oh, well, I don't want to be around too many single people because maybe I'll be single for the rest of my life. Or I don't want to lean too much into this because maybe that's what it is. But going like, Lord, what have you called me to? Like Kelly, like you were referencing a minute ago to say like that we're called to him. And we, I heard David Platt share one time, he just said, you know, don't think of it as like, am I called to be single? But like, am I called to be single right now? Like if you're single right now, then yes, you are called to singleness right now and just trust the Lord right where he has you. And I think that that's what we see in some of these modern day examples of women who trusted God right with where they were. And that doesn't mean that there weren't moments when they were like, this is not what I want. Like, this is not what I, you know, what I thought that the Lord had for me, but in the same light too, of the swing of in some moments just going, but this is his best for me right now. Like this is the way that I can bring him most glory is where he has me right now. And I think that that's what we lose sight of is that sometimes we're, we're either thinking in the past or we're thinking too far forward and we forget to live right now where we are and honor God with our current circumstances. And I think that there are so many women who do that so well and um, that I'm grateful for that example. And it was something that I, um, as a single woman would cling on to of going, okay, Lord, like, what do you want me to do with my singleness? And, you know, and he put me in a job where I traveled all the time. Well, then when I met Jonathan, I was kind of coming out of that season of travel. And I was really thankful I wasn't traveling all the time, but I was able to take advantage of every opportunity that the Lord put in front of me because I like, there wasn't somebody waiting on me at home. And not that I couldn't have done that as a married woman, but it definitely would have been difficult in a different sense. Oh yes. yes. Somebody said Lucy Swindoll in the chat. Absolutely. She's another one. Yeah, absolutely. She's she's amazing. Um, 
So Faith, I think that sometimes you are the picture of who we think of in our churches as being single because you're you're young and you haven't been married. So it tends to be like we when we think about how do we minister to single women, sometimes in our brains, like you're the picture of who we think of. But let's talk a little bit about how singleness does come in different circumstances and how we can't just lump and just go, hey, singles is this one category. Sure, absolutely. And also side note, I just want to go off of Mary Margaret because she has been, I've known Mary Margaret for years, like since I was, she was one of my babysitters, just to put it in perspective. (laughs) (laughs) Just to age both of us, it's fine. Yes. And so she was just such a beautiful model to me, especially I was going into ministry myself. And so it was so fun that we ended up working together, but just that domino effect is so beautiful. Mary Margaret was able to pour into me as now I get to pour into other um, of my girls, but um, yes. So to answer your question, Kelly, I think one of the things that we think about when we look at those who are married is we have the the newlyweds, we have the well-seasoned couple, we have the couple that's been married for 40, 50 plus years. Um, And with that, you know, the seasoned couple has grown, they've matured in their relationship, they look different than when they were in their honeymoon phase. And I think for whatever reason, we don't necessarily look at single people that way of when I was in 20, I mean, I'm 28 now, so there's not a big gap there. But when I was 20, how I responded and reacted as a single person was a lot different than how I live as a single person now. And if I'm, you know, 67, still single, that's going to look a lot different. And so I think we have to be cautious not to associate um, necessarily like because someone is single, there's a naivety there. Um, It's just different. It's, it's not someone has everyone has wisdom with where they're at and what the Lord has given them. And so I think we have to help empower single people, especially because I know for myself, sometimes I'll get around people who are even my age who are married and go, well, I don't know as much as they do because they've experienced marriage when that's not the truth. It's just, it's just different life stages. And like we were saying before, both are to be celebrated. Both are to be championed. Um, And like we were talking about before, singleness too, you do have people that look like me. You have those who have been divorced. You have those who have been widowed and how we minister, it's not going to be a one size fits all by any means. And I think one of the most powerful things that we can do is simply just to go up to somebody and ask. (laughs) I had a minister come to me just a couple of weeks ago and say, what is the best way that I can love on you in this season? And someone just coming and plainly asking me held so much power because a lot of times people tiptoe around it and think, oh, I can't bring it up because it'll make them feel a type of way when it's like, no, I have, I have specific needs that I need help with. And so I would say, don't be afraid just to simply go and ask, but also you need to have the courage to follow through. If you're going to ask, you need to show up. Um, and that's for anything across the board, <laughs> across the board. So I, I hope that helps. No, that's good. And I, I think what you just ended with is that it's, it's not, all, I mean, like it can be women of anywhere they are in life, yeah. in what stage they're in. So Adriana, I, I want you to jump in too, because as someone who was younger widowed, um, did you feel like, like it was kind of like, do people try to lump you into this category or did you feel like you were kind of set aside in a different way. Definitely. Um, you know, there's almost a stigma that's placed on you as a widowed uh, or a single person. And, you know, one of the things that I've really thought about is how we put labels on, on single people and even widows knowingly and, un- in, and inadvertently. And I think, um, we also think that because they're in a different season that they can't relate to us and we can't relate to them. Um, you know, I think about labels such as, you know, like there might be something wrong with them or, um, you know, we say things that are inappropriate, like, well, just put yourself out there. Um, you know, I miss being single. You're so lucky. I mean, just some of the things that we think about, um, like maybe their standards are too high, things like that. I, I think that uh, we just need to use caution and care 
uh, when, as Faith said, as we're approaching them, and we do need to to reach out and be intentional to do that. So, yeah, and I mean, because of that, like this is an important conversation for for those of you who are leading. Maybe you're leading women's ministry in your church, or maybe you lead a women's Bible study class, or however that looks. And I want to remind everyone: this is not like an outlier issue in the church. It's not. Um, some, a minority of people. There are 37, almost 38 million single households in the United States. That was 2022. So that is a fairly recent stat. So you've got all different kinds of pictures of what that looks like. But sometimes I, I feel like it's not the conversation we're having in our ministries, Mary Margaret. So why do why does this need to be such a conversation? I think it needs to be a conversation because in our churches, you know, I would say, obviously this is not a one size fits all answer, but most of our pastors are married. Most, a lot of our ministry leaders in our churches are married. And so they're looking at things from a lens of saying, Hey, like I'm thinking about this as a, like, I have a spouse, maybe I have kids. And, um, and one of the things that for like that, that really helped me is my pastor. When I lived in Nashville, he was single for a long time. And so he would always, when giving examples say, you know, my, if it's your, your husband, your roommate, your friend, like he always threw those terms in there too. And and it just made me feel included in the example he was giving as a part of his message, because I I was there as a part of the church body. And I think that we so often singleness is hard because we, in a lot of our church organizations and programs, we put people in their life stages. And so it's like married couples for, you know, that are this age, go over here, the empty nesters go over here, the young marrieds go over here. And it's like singles. And, and you, we lump, so often all the singles together when they are coming, like Adriana has said, from, from so many different perspectives and so many different situations and different ages and all of those things. And, you know, it'd be, it would be awkward for faith, a 28 year old to be in a singles group with 65 year old women who are widowed. I mean, like, not that it, not that they couldn't learn from each other, but that doesn't need to be the only way that, that they can connect in a church is through a singles group. And, and many of our churches are, are of the size where they like, you don't, they're not like, you don't need multiple singles groups because there just aren't enough people in your church. But I think to integrate singles into the the holistic body of the church is really crucial, but we can't miss out on that because it's not, maybe not our life situation. And I think that that's where, if you have a women's ministry team at your church, there ought to be a single woman on that team, whether she's a single mom, a widow, somebody always single, um, you know, but to have that voice at the table is crucial because she's going to speak up for things that you're, you may not naturally think of. And um, one of my mom's best friends is in her early seventies, has never been married. And she's, I call her my aunt um, because she's, I've known her since I was five and she is like family to us. And we include her in so many things that we do, but she is, um, you know, a lot of times at the holidays, she needs a place to go. And we're like, come on, come with us. Like you're part of our people. And, um, that has been one who's always said, it's so hard for me to find a place to serve at church because I don't feel called to kids ministry. And, and a lot of times that is where single women are lumped into is like, oh, well, they can serve at kids. They can serve all over the place because they've got plenty of time. And, um, and so we've got to make sure that our eyes are open and that we're hearing from single women so that we know where the pitfalls are. We know where the holes are and that we can make sure that they are cared for and well represented across our churches. I'm going to ask you just a follow up question to that, Mary Margaret, because uh-huh. um, and I'm going to go to the question that we kind of had kind of ahead of of this a little bit on being more intentional about including single women in our ministry and in our leadership. But I'm seeing a lot of things in the chat section about single moms. Mm -hmm. And so I I think it would behoove us just to kind of go, how do we make sure that single moms like is how do we how do we include them in a way that they don't feel alienated? They don't feel like they're um, just like in a the separate category, but how do we make sure that they are getting what they need? Yeah. And, um, and obviously I can't speak from experience on that, but I do have a few friends who are single moms. And I think it is, it is saying what needs need to be met that, that they are doing completely on their own. And, and a lot of that has to do with childcare. 
And, and there, when you are doing a Bible study at church and, um, you know, maybe you're offering something in the evening for women, because most likely those single moms are working during the day, um, and they have their kids at night and it's just them, you know, to offer childcare, um, is a huge piece of the puzzle for them, you know, and I think it's, it's like faith said, it's asking and saying, what do you need? How can we help? And not assuming what they need. Cause even I worked with a guy who, um, on the last church church staff where I served full time, he was on my team and he was a single dad for a long time. His wife had passed away. And like, when I mentioned something about single parents, he was like, no, 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 Mary Margaret. Like, that's not, he was like, that would not be helpful. And I was like, okay, so sorry. Like I, I spoke out of turn because that has not been my experience. And so I think asking the question is really important. And of just going, how can our, you know, we have a mandate in scripture, whether it is, um, you know, we have a mandate to take care of widows and orphans and not every single mom is a widow. You know, and we have to think of that too, that like, we do have a mandate to care for widows, but, you know, but also um, for those kids who don't have a father in the picture as, you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't there. I mean, we could go through 1 million scenarios here of all the different ways that um, single families function. But I think it's to say, let's look at the men and women of our church and say, how can we best serve our body? How can we best serve these people who are a part of our church, who we care about? And whether that is like, changing oil in their car or showing up for a project that needs doing at their house or just, but I think the most important thing is to ask and just to say, what do you need? And don't make assumptions. Exactly. And I do think that sometimes we assume different things, but let's be people who include them in asking the right questions and then listening and then actually putting some things into place. When you do hear those things, those are all really, really good things. Okay. So two words that come up a lot when we talk about singleness um, is loneliness and contentment. So I would love for all of you to jump in and just talk about maybe how have those played in your life and maybe how did the church do a good job or maybe not a good job of helping you address loneliness or contentment. Um, Faith, I'll start with you. I think we lost Faith a minute ago. Oh, did we lose Faith? Yes. Okay. Adriana, do you want to jump in? We yeah, did. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've walked through many seasons of loneliness and contentment as a single woman and as a widow, and loneliness is real. It's addressed in scripture as well. And although that God says it's, you know, not good for man to be alone, while that's true, he doesn't always call everyone to marriage. And, you know, God has certainly used seasons of loneliness in my life as a single woman, as a young widow, and as a married woman to deepen my walk and um, trust in him. And He's faithfully carried me through those times and is still teaching me the lifelong lessons of the importance of contentment, uh, even as a married woman. You know, the church, uh, although it's not perfect, it has provided, you know, those things that I've needed as a widow, as a young widow. Um, and then there's times where, you know, they haven't been able to do that. So I've experienced both uh, in both of those seasons of my life. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mary Margaret? I know just so you know, Faith's Wi-Fi went out, so she's trying to get back on. So hopefully she'll be back on here in a second. So Mary Margaret, I'll let you jump in on this. Yeah, um, I think those two words are, you know, they're very appropriate for um, for any of us. But in thinking about singleness, um, for me, one like real life tangible example that I think of is um I think after I turned 30, my parents got married at 31. And so I think for the longest time, I was like, well, my parents didn't get married. They were in their early thirties. And like, but like when I turned 31 and was still single, I kind of went bug eyed and was like, oh my gosh, I'm still single. And, and I think it was just the, it wasn't, it, it was just discontentment in my, in my own heart. And it was some things that the Lord had to work on in me and just some expectations I had set for myself, um, you know, that all wrapped around loneliness and contentment, discontentment and those sort of things. Um, but in the same breath, the practical thing that I remember happening is that there were you know, I had quite a bit of like hand-me-down furniture. I had some ugly plates that I bought at Target at some point in my life when I thought that like I should mix greens and browns and like they just were ugly. And like I had half my plates were green, half of them were brown. And I just thought that was cute when I was like 23. And, but here I am in my early thirties going, I hate these plates. But in my mind, I had, it's like, I'd always held off on buying some nice things for myself because I was like, well, when I get married, I'll register for that stuff. And when I get married, I'll do this or that I'll purchase this for myself. And I had to realize that I was like, 
I, I, I didn't need to sit around waiting on marriage to have some nice things that made me feel more at home in my own house and made me enjoy the dishes that I used in my kitchen. And I know that that can sound silly, but like for me, it was one of those things where I had to find contentment in my season and just go, you know what? Like I, I don't want to miss out on the season where I am and allow myself to be discontent because I'm waiting on these things for marriage that really don't require marriage to have, you don't have to be married to have nice dishes in your house. And so I knew, I already knew what I wanted. And so I, that's what I asked for Christmas for one year. And my parents gave me, I think eight place settings of the, the China that I wanted of my everyday stuff. And, and I think the Lord really used some tangible things like that to teach me that it wasn't completely about, um, you know, that it was so much more about my heart and my heart with him and me being content in who I was as a woman and not about my life circumstances. And, um, and that was, and I think even in moments too, when I'm, you know, being married and I can feel discontent or I can feel lonely in some like, and I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. Why am I feeling lonely? Um, you know, but of, of going, those are hard issues. They're not, they're not to do with my life circumstance. They really are an issue of my heart that I have to get right with the Lord, but just between me and him. Yeah. And, and loneliness, like you said, it's not just something that, singles like you can be lonely in a marriage yeah so i think that's a, a good point there as well all right adriana so how do we help married people okay this is a question that you all brought up and i think it's so funny because it happens all the time um married people always want to fix people up that are single so how do we help married people understand that singles can be happy and they aren't just looking for someone to fix them up now some of you may want somebody to help you fix you up but still how do we how do we not like say those kinds of things yes this is i love this question because it's definitely something we need to address um you know i i always say none of us came out of our mother's womb married so we all entered this life single and unmarried um, but I think it's important to remember that being single is not a defect. It's not a death sentence and it's not life altering. So it's important to remind married people that they need to encourage single women to pursue Christ. And I think that's an important thing to not forget. You know, he has a call in their lives in the season that they're in. It doesn't have to change. Um, if God desires for them to be married, then he'll make that happen. Um, but it's not their job to fix them up. It's, not, it's their job to pray for God's will to be done in their lives. And then also, you know, just to be a godly example of what marriage does look like in case the Lord does uh, bring someone into their life. So I think it's, we need to be more advocates and encouragers for them to pursue Christ in their current season of life. Yeah, I think that's good. But then also faith. So how do we validate? Maybe there's a, you know, single women who, her emotional and her feelings that she has a desire for marriage. So how do we help validate those feelings and in, in helping her understand you know, why it hasn't happened yet? Absolutely. I think there is a place to honor the grieving process. There's a, a time to be able to sit with someone and go, listen, I know this is a desire that you have in your heart and we don't discredit that. We don't look down on you and say like, you have to just completely wipe that out of your head and your heart and move on and find something else. But being able to sit and honor and go, listen, the Lord has made you to, to have these feelings and do you desire that? And that's okay. I think the point comes when we sit in it and we allow ourselves to go past even a sweet time of grieving um, and into a place of bitterness. And I think that's something single people we need to watch out for. And I think that's when we have to be able to champion one another as a community of God's people and to be able to look out for the signs of, okay, sister, it's time to like, come on, get up off the floor. <laughs> We've got to go. The Lord has called you to some things. And when, when we are so focused on grieving or so focused on not wanting to be single, we really are missing out on what the Lord has for us. There was, there was one point where I think I had realized that I was spending more time preparing myself for my future husband than I was preparing myself for the coming of Christ, what he's actually called us to in scripture. And I needed a little bit of a wake up call. I needed to wake up and see that 
those emotions that I had let run rampant in my spirit had created an idol. And that is a dangerous place to be in. And so community is so important in this time and to not push back when someone looks at you and goes, sister, (laughs) it is time to get up and to receive that well. Yeah, that's really, I mean, that's a good encouragement, Faith. Okay, I know all three of you, when you've been in, you know, single, People have said the wrong thing, you know, whether they've said, hey, we, we know someone or whatever, or why aren't you married yet? You're a great person, you know, blah, blah, blah. So what are some wrong things that we say to single women? I'd love to hear all of you just kind of say, so that we can learn, don't say these things. I would say, you know, things like you've already said, Kelly, you know, why aren't you married yet? Are you dating? Do you want to be married? Um, and you know, I, I always, I can't help but think about the widow because, you know, I, I was her. And so I would just add some things, uh, for things not to say, even to widows, like, please don't ask them what happened. It is so gut wrenching. And, you know, it really is makes her have to relive it all over again. And, um, every time someone asks her, uh, and I just really have a simple rule that I follow, and it's um, regardless of what woman it is, what stage in her life she is, just don't ask. You know, if a woman wants to share the details of her heart and her life, she will, if yeah. she's comfortable doing so. Um, but asking personal questions really puts people on the spot and sometimes makes them defensive. So I think we need to use caution uh, when we're opening our mouth. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and I'm, I'm watching the chat and I'm sitting here going, uh-huh, 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 that there are, like, there were so many people that looked at me at one point or another and said, I just can't believe you're still single. And I was like, I wanted to be like, what, what is that supposed to mean? Like, what, what are you trying to tell me here today? <laughs> like, it just, and the, by the, like, after I think, you know, being in my early thirties and single, I just want to be like, why are you like, why would you say this out loud? And I think when a lot of people get married. I, I would always describe it as like that. It's like they have single amnesia and it's like, you forget no matter what age you got married, um, you forget what it was like to be single. And I think we have to, like it, Adriana was saying, like, we have to remember that all, all of us have been single. We've all been there. Even if you got married in your early twenties, right out of high school, anything like that to go, did what I want somebody asking me this, what I want somebody asking me these very personal questions. And usually the answer is no, because if somebody wants to talk about it, they will bring it up. But just, I think we have got to think about what we say before we say it, because even though it can kind of sound cute and funny, it's usually, and maybe they're going to laugh when you say it, but like inside it just hurts. And I think a lot of times it's just because we're speaking before we're thinking. I was, yeah. I also, I, Sorry, I lost my Wi-Fi, so I'm flipping on my phone if y'all see me moving my hands around. But I would say one thing is um, if single other like single guys walk into a room, like that's not necessarily a time to come and start raiding people or, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like it sort of just becomes like this TV show sometimes entering into a space (laughs) and no too, I think just know your relationship with that person. Cause there are definitely people who are dear to me who, if they ask questions or bring things up, it's, I'm like, come on, let's process through this together. Um, and there's other people where I'm just like, you don't even know, like my last name, let alone what I, how I'm feeling in singleness. Um, so I, that's one thing I would two things I would say, but definitely just being cautious of when, when single people are, are walking into a space. Um, cause, cause I could have as many husbands as Solomon did wives. If I, you know, <laughs> listen to some of these people. Um, so yeah. Oh man. Okay. So I know we've got a lot of married women on the, the webinar too, who are just like, they're trying to figure out like, how do I do this better? So how can married women be a blessing to the single, to their single friends? Faith, why don't you jump on that one? Sorry, I was looking in the chat. Um, How can married people encourage single, single friends? Yes. So I, one of the things that I love about the Lord's community is that we all need each other. And so I think it's important for singles and married couples to know that the the gift and the blessing is mutual between 
all parties. <laughs> and so I have a lot, a lot, most of my friends are, are married and I've been able to pour in and, and love on them in ways that another single couple couldn't. Um, and they've been able to do that for me as well as a married couple, you know, into my life. And so um, I would say, don't, don't discount if there's a single person, a single woman in your life who like continue to let her to pour into you. Um, because Paul and Jesus were pouring into married people's lives all the time. It, it wasn't just Paul's ministry wasn't just to single people. And so that's, that's so important. But I think some things Mary Margaret kind of went over is just inviting people in, especially to your home. I have girls who, as they're graduating and going off, I say, find a family who can love on you. Find um, just just that family who will bring you in and do life with you, who will walk with you in all seasons. Um, I've spent a lot of holidays with one specific family here in Kingwood who has just continued to open their door to me, and it has become a very safe space for me. So that's what I would say. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add on. Okay, so Mary Margaret, something to add on to that is that I think that, um, and um, is that sometimes we assume that single women have more time. Y'all kind of mentioned that at one point and we volunteer, like we're like, hey, you can help us with this. How do we help avoid that trap of, thinking that single women, they, they have all the time in the world. And I think, again, it's when you have some single friends in your life, you'll learn very quickly that they don't have all the time in the world. And But if you don't have single friends, it's very easy to make that assumption. And for me, it was looking back and just saying, I have to do all the things. Like I have to do all the stuff at the house. I have to do all the stuff for my car. I have to do all the things because I don't have anybody to share that with. And, um, and so that didn't mean that just because I was single that I had all this time laying around. And also let me just throw this one in here as another piece of advice. Just because a woman is single does not mean she wants to babysit your kids all the time. You know, and I think that we can't all like, it's one thing for kids ministry at church to go like, Hey, will you serve? We have a need. And it's another one to go, I'll pay you to watch my kids or like, don't you love them? Don't you want to come play with them? And it's like, I was sitting there going call a high school or call a college student. Like I'm 30 and I don't need an extra 40 bucks tonight. Like I would rather sit at home and watch Netflix or something, but it's when you have single friends in your life, you will be much more aware of how their time is spent of the things that are those pitfalls, the thing, the stupid things that people say. And I think that the blessing of having single friends, like one of my best friends is single and, you know, and she long, she is one who longs to be married and wants that. Um, but I, we, she still lives in Nashville. She was my roommate for a long time. Um, Michelle knows her very well. And, um, but she is where she's coming down for a visit. Cause I have been begging her. I'm like, come spend like a long weekend with us. Like we want you to come visit. And every time we go to Nashville, we always make time to see her. And, um, and my husband is friends with her too. Like they are buddies. And so it's when you have those people in your life, it then ch like changes the scenario of the way that you think. And, um, and so I think that that's how, when we think about, um, that single women have all of this free time, it, it, you, you probably don't know your single friends very well. If you make that assumption. Yeah. And I think we can also, can I say one more thing? I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. I was, didn't mean to ramble, but I think that that's where we can also stand up for our single friends when somebody else makes a comment like that and just go, you're crazy. She's so busy. Like that we can speak up and stand up for our friends that way too. When we see somebody else making one of those mistakes. Yeah, that's good. I, I want to make sure we have time. If you have a question, go into the q and I see a couple of questions, so I'm going to get Michelle to that for just a second. But one more question before we get to that is that I do think sometimes singles feel a little left out at holiday celebrations around like church, like maybe like we're coming up on Easter or maybe it's Christmas or Thanksgiving and it seems like it's really geared towards families or things like that. So how do we do a better job in our churches around celebrations and holidays? Anybody can jump in on that one. It's being intentional and inviting them. You know, we, I think we forget sometimes that we are the body of Christ. So we are, because of Jesus, we're sis, every, every woman is our sister. And so just like you would invite your biological sister, you should invite your Christian sister to your table. 
include them in the process of preparing the meal, or if it's a holiday time, invite them over to help decorate. I think that we, there's different things we can be to, we can do to be extremely intentional to help um, you know kind of mitigate some of the loneliness that they will go through during those times. And you know, holidays are one of the loneliest times for single people and widows. And so I think just doing those little things uh, means so much, making someone a cake and bringing it to them. I mean, just the little things, but really getting to know them, find out what they like, what they like to do. It could be buying buying them a movie ticket so that they're, you know, not, do, you know, just sitting in the house all the time. So there's a lot of creative ways we can include them um, as a part of our holiday with our families as well. I would say to you, I have, so living out in the Houston area, all of my family is in Florida and I've never been alone for a holiday that I've been here for. And I think one of the sweet things is, is that bouncing exactly off of what you're saying. Um, even like Valentine's day, I've had families invite me over and it hasn't been weird for me because they've included me in their life outside of the holidays as well. And that has been so valuable. So it hasn't felt like a pity invite or anything like that. It's you're already a part of our life. So why would you not? I mean, I'm, I'm going to be here for Easter. And so I know exactly where I'm going for Easter. I know I'm going to have to bring a meal, a part of the meal. I know I'm probably going to burn it. <laughs> they know that as well. <laughs> um, but again, it's, I have done a lot of life with them outside of Easter, outside of Valentine's Day, outside of all of all of that. And so that's the beautiful thing, even about these women for me that are on this panel is I've done so much life with them. And so I value when they bring me in and it feels comfortable. It doesn't feel like a second thought, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I'm just going to reiterate something that you mentioned, because I don't know that we think about this a whole lot. And it, but for a single especially a single woman, maybe around Easter, who's on church staff, you all realize like she's not getting Easter off to go home to her family. Like Easter is like the Super Bowl of church life. And so if she's on church staff, she's not going home. To, so as we are approaching that particular holiday, as if you're watching this, I would definitely think, consider maybe someone in your church family who's single, who's on staff, who maybe doesn't have a place to go that day um, after church or to invite them to something because they are working really hard at, on their church staff that day. So I just know that that has been important for some of my single friends when people have been intentional about inviting them over to their homes on Easter. So that's a great, a great point, Faith. All right, Michelle, give us the questions. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, some really, really great um, questions here. This is a, I think a really important one. How do you deal with pastors who don't believe you are qualified to in leading the women's ministry team because you can't counsel married women or because you're divorced? So if you're the single, a single woman on staff, either because you've never been married or you're married, but now divorced, how do you navigate that with uh, other staff members and pastors on your, at your church? Well, I, I would just say that um, my marital status, um, is, as long as I'm in alignment with what scripture says, does not disqualify me from coming alongside to minister to a woman that is hurting. Um, you know, the commonality we have together is that we're all women. And so uh, I don't think it's it's an area that you should be contentious with your pastor in. Uh, I think you can lovingly and prayerfully approach him. Uh, and, and hopefully the Lord will help him to see that, you know, you can come alongside her in ways that he specifically can't. And so, again, I don't think it's something worth um, getting into a heated debate about. Uh, because God's not honored in that, but there are ways that you can come alongside that sister in Christ, uh, regardless of your personal, um, you know, marital status. And I think as you lead a team, as you do women's ministry, um, 
you very quickly realize that you have not been in every life situation and that one of the best things you can do is know, know the women of your church, know their stories and, and be able to have somebody that you can pair someone up with to have that kind of conversation. If it's something that you've never experienced, but at the heart of it too, no matter what our life circumstance, we can always pray with women. We can encourage them with scripture. We can point them back to the Lord. And, you know, I have a friend, um, whose husband passed away four years ago from a brain tumor. And she just always says like, you know, what can, you know, when people say, what can you do for me? She said, send scripture, pray for me and, um, and say his name out loud. And like, she, she has told us specific things that we can do. And I'm like, I've never been in her situation, but I know how to help and encourage because she's told me how, and just as like Adriana was saying, like, as, as sisters in Christ, we can come alongside and do some of those things, whether or not we've been in those circumstances. So I would just say, have a kind, compassionate conversation with your pastor. And, and just to say, you know, there are a lot of women that I can't relate to because we have different life life circumstances, but my job will be to help identify the right women who can, and to know some local counselors, I can point them to. And, um, and just to say, there are other ways I can resource these women, even if it's not me specifically handling that situation. That's good. And I think going off of what Mary Margaret was saying too, one thing that we have at our church is we have vetted a lot of counselors in the area. And so when people come to us, we've already got a list of counselors, what they specialize in, um, because I think what she's saying, that connection is so key. I mean, I I can relate that with me in student ministry. I don't have any kids, Um, but I exactly. I'm doing what Mary Margaret's saying is how can I connect these parents with one another? How can I just be a listening ear or provide them with resources? But, um, especially what Adriana was saying too, of like, we just want to respect each other at the end of the day too. So, um, in having that conversation with your pastor. That's good. That's really good. Okay. Here's a good one. How do you minister to single women who are having ungodly dating situations or relationships? maybe sex outside of marriage. Um, How do you help those that are really, they really struggle and feel like they either have to be dating someone or they have to be in this relationship, but it gets to an unhealthy point. How do you point them back? I think definitely to the Lord, but how, how, how would you answer that? You know, that's a, a very serious question and serious topic, certainly, and would love to hear what um, some of my peers have to say, but Ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to point your sister in Christ back to scripture and what God says, and that the way that she's currently living is not honoring to the Lord. It's not honoring to her own temple even. And so uh, I think pointing people to scripture is important. Certainly, if you have walked through something like that, you can share your experience with her. Um, But you know, it's definitely, there needs to be a whole level of accountability. I mean, like this, this could be a whole webinar just on this topic, uh, truly. Um, But we do have to point people back to scripture lovingly Mm -hmm. um, and and remind her that because we are her her sister in Christ, that we care for her and we want to see her um, on the path that the Lord wants her on. And the current path that she's on um, is not going to end well. Um, if she continues in pursuit of that lifestyle. So that's what I would add. It's very good. Good. Mm-hmm. I'm going to add on to that, that. I think kind of what you just said about pointing them to Christ, pointing them to God's word, because one of the other questions was, you know, how do you know if you should be making yourself more available to date any, but I'm I'm thinking that's, that's, they need to be walking so close with the Lord that they know deep that from the Holy Spirit's power and presence in their life um that it's okay it's okay to date or to date online or what you know whatever it might be uh, another great um uh question here and uh, Adriana this is more for you um do you find your experience as a single black woman uh I'm just thinking any woman of color here um is the experience different um compared to other singles from another race it's kind of the question here. You know, I, I look at, obviously I am a, a woman of color, uh, but I first look at myself as a Christian. So I am a Christian who happens to be African-American. And so I honestly think it's it's based on, it could be based on each individual, uh, but I'm a human being and I, I walk through pain just like Kelly or you, Michelle, or any of my Caucasian sisters. I have a heart just like they do. 
And so I experience pain just like they do. So I don't think that there, at least for me, there's not a difference in how I would walk through or how I walked through being a widow at 24. Uh, so I, I do think it's based on the person. I don't think you can um, group it all into, you know, all African Americans experience, you know, a life experience in a certain way. So, but again, I do look at through my lens is I'm a Christian first. Mm-hmm. And then I am a, a woman of color. That's so good. And and I think that also applies to, it doesn't matter their age, their economic status, their mm-hmm. ethnicity, whether single, married, divorced, widowed, we have to find out the individual needs of that particular woman to really minister to her, but always in all of those pointing them back to Christ, pointing them back to God's word. Another great question here that we'll probably- Michelle, we're just, we're out of time, just so (laughs) we're at noon. Um, So I, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut it off because I really do want to make sure that we stay on task and stay true to our one hour, but thank you. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been such a great conversation. It is, I always get this question, but I remind you, um, we do record these. We do upload them to the Lifeway Women's YouTube channel. So you can always go back. Maybe this is a conversation you wanna have with your team. So do that as well too. So thanks ladies for joining us today. And we hope that you'll join us again for our next webinar. All right, see you later.